How to sell more cars. Lancaster, the company is Terry Lancaster Marketing, um, and I and I do just that. Marketing means I help people sell stuff. It's pretty uh, pretty pretty straightforward. Primarily, I help car dealerships. I've been uh, in, in the automotive advertising business for about the last four decades. I've written more automotive radio commercials than any other human being on the face of the earth. Probably ten. 11,000 or something something at this point. But I mostly help car dealers. 95% of my work is with car dealers. If you know a car dealer, if you uh, if you love a car dealer, if you, if you're connected to a car dealer, I would love an introduction to them. I help them produce radio and TV spots. I write blog posts for them. I do direct mail for them. I send all their best customers postcards and Christmas cards so they know that they love them so they come back again and again and again. And I do that for other people too. I train uh salespeople whether they're automotive salespeople or insurance salespeople or real estate agents or whoever need that, I train them to market themselves the same way that uh, to, because the the role of the salesman has changed a little bit. It's not it's not so much just just shaking hands and kissing babies right there at the door when they walk in. Salespeople have to market themselves these days, no matter what you're selling. And we all have social media and we all have these tools. And a lot of salespeople aren't necessarily the greatest at using the marketing tools. So I help them and kind of teach them to market themselves like I've been marketing myself from, from my bedroom uh, after my neck at yoga classes for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. So uh, so uh, maybe we'll, uh, I, don't, I haven't figured out how to have, have those on Zoom, Blaine, but if I do, you will be the first that I call. Um, so uh, our, our, our speaker today is Blaine Little, and Blaine is, uh, is, is, is one of my heroes. He's, he's, he's a member of the Toastmaster organization. Bob's got his Toastmasters uh, backboard up there. He, he helped me get involved in Toastmasters uh, years ago, and I was com competing in that and, and doing a lot of that, which I, I left Toastmasters because I ended up doing so many podcasts. Uh, that I didn't have time to do uh, to do Toastmasters. I was on a guest after the after the first book came out. I was on about a hundred podcasts over the, the course of the next year. So that that really uh, helped me uh, learn to 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 do my table topics. But Blaine was instrumental in all of that, and I've watched him grow. He's grown momentum seminars. He's he's traveled around the country helping business people implement uh, better management strategies uh, to uh, to grow their business. And today he's going to talk about some of his ideas. And some of uh, Brian Tracy's ideas. Blaine Little, how you doing, buddy? You're on awesome, mute. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate that. And uh, you know, as we dive into this book, and I do have a PowerPoint just to kind of keep us on track. But I want to ask, how many of y'all? This is a classic in business: "The Psychology of Selling" by Brian Tracy. And how many of y'all have read this book? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Really? Oh, well, this is wonderful. Well, this will just be enough to just barely wet your whistle. I encourage you to go out and get this book. So we're going to dive into it a little bit and uh, and go into just a few things that's in here over the next 10 minutes. And I know that Terry has some time saved up for Q&A, but if I come across something and you want to discuss it, I'm fine. Let's just kind of open this up a little bit more discussion style rather than seminar. And um, and there you go. All right. So let me see if I can bring up my PowerPoint. There we go. And uh, okay, I, I, I'm taking it. Y'all can see that. Good. Okay. So Brian Tracy, the psychology of selling. It is a classic, and I should have probably looked up when this thing was written. It was probably about 20, 25 years ago. Of course, Brian Tracy, is anybody here not familiar with Brian Tracy? Well, Brian Tracy has written several books, and uh, here's the thing. I, I, In fact, years ago, I would listen to Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, Dennis Waitley, a lot of the Tony Alessandro a lot of those guys, Earl Nightingale, on cassette tape. Anybody back in the 80s have a cassette tape in their car and they would listen to some of that? Yeah? What does Zig Ziglar called it? I think he called it the Automobile University. And you could get an entire education just by listening to things in, in the car. Well, here's the thing. Years ago, I would listen to him, and I really did not like Brian Tracy. <laughs> So 
why psychology is selling because Blaine's not really a fan. And I tell you this because I had listened to some of his other stuff. Uh, there's He's got a book that's still kind of new, came out a couple, three years ago called Eat That Frog. That's a concept from Mark Twain. And I'm just like, eh. But I was somewhere, I think maybe at an ASP event. And I won this as the door prize. I had always heard of it and like, yeah, it's a classic in, in sales and you got to get it. And, and like, yeah, I'm just not a huge Brian Tracy fan. Well, I started going through this and it is amazing. There's probably not anything in here that's an original idea, but it's just really well put together. And uh, you need if you want better sales, you need to get this book, check it out. Let's dive into it a little bit. Sales, psychology. Is it really about psychology? I mean, isn't it about sales tactics and setting your goals? And yeah, setting your goals is part of it. But why in the world psychology that we talk about? Well, first, we need to understand the customer's needs. When we go to sales training, if uh, years ago I used to sell uh, uh, for Brinks, home security, and they sent me to Atlanta for a year uh, when I was with SkillPath and would travel all over the world, they would send me to, I went to Kansas City for a week. Um, oh, and, and so with Brinks, I went to Atlanta for a week. I may have said it here. But, uh, and you would go and you would learn all the features of what your product or service can do. They don't care. <laughs> the bells and whistles is not what they care about. Customers want to understand the benefits. Now, features may bring you the benefits, but they want to know the benefits. How do you help solve a problem? And a wonderful quote that's in the book is, uh, whatever you're saying to a prospect about your product or your service, imagine that he is just asking you, so what? So what? And that will actually keep you on the right path because we get so ingrained in our own mind of what something can do. Hey, do you want a two-hour seminar or do you want an all-day workshop? What would you like? They don't care. You know, we have communication problems or I've got a bunch of new managers and none of them have had management training before. I need to get them up to speed. They don't really care how long it is, how many slides I'm going to have, what kind of, you know, uh, a book is helpful. I've written some books, but they want to know what are you going to do for them? And so we need to remind, remind ourselves of that. Understanding what the customer needs. Building poor. We might not necessarily get the sale the very first time that we meet with someone. Oftentimes we don't, but we need to keep in touch with them and begin a relationship. One of the things that I talk about in my seminars is that rapport is uh, on the road to building trust. And in sales, people will say, well, you got to have trust. You got to build trust. Well, that's fantastic. Rarely are you ever going to build trust in one day or in one meeting. So it just, at first it goes to likability. Do they just not find you obnoxious? And then it goes to building rapport. And what rapport is, it's where we start to see ourselves in someone else. There's a lot of similarities. So I can identify with that. And if I can see similarities in you that are traits within me, then I begin to start to trust you. So you have to find people likable, build rapport, and then you can get into that trust. But we need to keep, maintain those relationships along the way. And that goes into creating trust again. Um, that's ultimately what we want. But remember, when we first talk to a customer, it's, it's not about what we can sell, but how can we help them? Okay. Questions, comments, concerns on, on any of that. I'm going to blow right forward. All right. So psychology, the psychology of selling. What about our own psychology, our own well-being, all right? We need to be able to manage our expectations. And by that, what I mean is that 
we're going to be rejected a lot. And we just have to realize that. And we have to frame rejection in the right way. It's not that they don't like us. They're just saying no to our goods or our services at that time. But within our own mind, what is our expectations? Scientists say that we will more than likely never achieve more than 10% beyond what we believe we're worth. Imagine that. Imagine that. So does your income have uh, uh, five figures or is it six figures or seven figures? And there is a guy out there who sold a book. He said, just whatever your goals were for last year, just multiply them by 10. Well, your brain does not work like that. Your brain knows bullshit when it hears it, even if it's from you. And so we have to kind of build our self-esteem up, manage our expectations, because if we just look on what we did last year, um, well, you know, I made X, X dollars amount, you know, um, am I going to do that again or 10% more? We have to elevate our thinking. And one way that we do that is by plugging in to people like all of you and others who have been successful. And we can actually raise our expectations in a way that mind finds it more believable because what our mind sees, it believes. Self-talk, woo! Has anybody been the victim of self-talk? Put your hands up, get your hands up. Yeah, we all have. And it really is a protection mechanism that we try to avert disaster by preparing for the worst. And it's natural. You know, it goes back to cavemen. And, uh, you know, what if I go out and I'm looking for a little lizard or iguana for lunch one day, but then I'm not going to leave the cave because I'm afraid I'll be attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. Well, you have to talk yourself out of these things because your mind is going to live in fear. That's just the way we're created. But how many of our fears actually come to life? Very few very few. And so if you're afraid of the saber tooth tiger, you know, you just need to get a bigger spear. <laughs> uh, time management. Woo! This is huge. And I could really go more broad than this, but he's basically talking about time management, but I will say routines, routines, develop a system. That is huge. That keeps us on track. I get off track, I have to be honest here, I get off track way more than I care to admit. And uh, it's almost daily. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I got to, I got to, you know, uh, writing. I was doing a lot of writing over the weekend. And then for some weird reason, I just started looking up uh, little tiny towns in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a country called Eritrea which is a place I would love to visit one day. But I just start Googling and looking at the little maps and they're like, and it was like a, an hour I was doing that. I was like, what am I doing? Get back to work, get back to writing. So we have to maintain our own psychology. It's not just the, uh, the customer psychology that we need to deal with. And last thing here is, as you see in the picture, if you can see that, that is a really messy desk. That's my desk now. No, it's not. No, it's not that bad. Thank God. But, uh, you know, if, if you were seeing my desk, it's really messy. Well, the power of suggestion, one, you start with yourself. That's success. And if I were in person right now, I would absolutely have a client. Our society is kind of, we're okay with webinars and online being in a pullover polo, which is comfortable. And I dig that. But uh, uh, definitely dress for success. If I call on somebody, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to be in a coat and a tie and, uh, you know, have my, have, my hair, have my hair gel all good to go, everything. Smelling pretty. Practice your presentation, your sales presentation. Don't just wing it. Go through it and understand what it is that you're doing. Play devil's advocate. 
with yourself. Again, it kind of goes to that quote from Brian to where it says, whenever you're talking to a prospect about your goods or services, imagine that he is saying, so what? How do you deal with objections? Practice presentation. And finally, work from a clean desk. If your work environment is cluttered, your brain is going to be cluttered. And I tried to declutter in here um, over the weekend, and I still have, I, I have hours of work to do because I've got stacks of book products and uh, videotapes and, and CDs and stuff all over the place. And I got to, I don't know, I may have to get a storage facility or something or, or put it out in my garage, but work from a clean desk. So that's something I put in there because that's something is a challenge for me. And I'm still, I'm still working on that. So just a really light, fast uh, intro read on, uh, on, on, on the psychology of selling by Brian Tracy. Unfortunately, I don't get loyalties out of this. I may start selling this though, but Definitely go get this book. All right. Great. Put you put you a link on your Facebook, but put it to Amazon on there. Yeah, um Blaine, uh what the thing that, that jumped out to me was the uh the part on expectations because that is one of the things I wrote about in my book, Better Self Help for the Rest of Us, that it uh says expectations are the enemy of happiness. And I I, I wrote that. And turn, I, I thought it was kind of a kind of a, an original thing for me, and it turns out that is uh, it's 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 Stoicism and it's Buddhism and everything else, and the uh, and all of these people talk about falling in love with the process. As in a salesperson, if you go in um, expecting a sale, or or that's all you got on your mind is the sale. I have a buddy um, who is a guest on my podcast who, who called it commission breath. When they 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 can smell you from a while, mile away. <laughs> You, uh, Blaine says your brain can tell when it's bullshit. Well, they can smell when you're just hustling them. So, so yeah. you know, the, the expectations are, are the one thing. But if you go in and you're in love with the process, you're in love with making the connection. You're in love with informing them and educating them and finding ways to help their business. If you're in love with the process, the outcome is going to take care of themselves. So uh, that's, a, that's a, been a big thing for me is to, is to worry about process and not outcome. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and, you know, it kind of, and one of the things that about to your goals and prospect daily and get your numbers going on. And, and, and I have actually said for years, stop being concerned about what the other people say, whether they say yes or no, that's completely out of your control. But what is in your control is, do you say, okay, that's cool. Let me call on you maybe in a few months next that is in my control. So how hard you prospect and work is definitely, so you're absolutely right. Who else has something to add? Go ahead, Lincoln. You, you know, there's so much myths about selling. Selling should be fun, number one. If it's not fun, find another job. You're in the wrong job. Number two, okay. I've seen a lot of young salespeople that have an appointment. They drive 15, 20 miles to this appointment. In their mind, I have an appointment. And they're already closing the sale before they even get there. So they get there, and the secretary comes out, and the secretary says, I'm sorry, but an emergency came up, and the boss cannot see you today. And now they're deflated. Instead of, in the moment, in that moment, find something to, to do. Go meet somebody else in that, in that community, in, the, in that organization, because the more cheerleaders you have in, the, in that organization, the higher the probability you're going to recruit cheerleaders. Say hello to somebody. I've seen salespeople walk into dealership, Terry, and they head straight for the GM's office. They don't say hello to anybody. You know, nobody. And then the park, where you park your car, especially if you're selling to auto dealers, don't park in front of the door. <laughs> yeah. Park far away. They'll cut your head off. You take that spot. That's prime parking spot. <laughs> you know, and then ask permission. Sales people don't ask permission. Is now still a good time? That shows respect and caring about your prospect's time. Is now still a good time? 
that reduces the pressure because the moment they hear sales people, they might you know they think it's a pressure point. But you want to let the guard down. Is now still a good time for us to meet? Because you're not a one-stop call kind of person. You're not selling, you know, <clears throat> perfume or something like that. You're selling a service, and and you could always come back. You could always come, and then in today's world with this thing, this is a tool. You you have to wait 10, 15 minutes, make some calls. Yeah. Make some calls, don't beat up on yourself. This guy doesn't want to have another appointment. And that's the other thing, people make back-to-back -back appointments, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Talk about time management, don't do that. Because you're going to get stuck and you have to call the next appointment, I'm running late. You're just setting up yourself for failure from the get-go. And finally, diagnose before you prescribe. Diagnose before you prescribe. Don't assume you know what they need. Because you know what happens when you assume. <laughs> <laughs> my, my buddy Pat Helmers calls that you find the itch before you pitch. If, 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 <laughs> if, if, if you walk in pitching, you don't know where to scratch. So make, make sure you find the itch before you pitch. Patricia, you had something to add. What does this group think about the morning of reminder email? Yeah. I hope still going to see you at 1030. Is that still good? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could come back and say, no, never mind. Yeah, they could. But it saves you a lot of wasted time if they tell oh, yeah. you no. Right. I have an right. appointment thing that sends them reminders because I used to have about 20% failure rate when I would show up, my client wouldn't be there. Even if they're not paying for the meeting, it's part of a package, they would be busy or on vacation. And when I started texting and email reminders, it went down to like less than 5% of no shows or appointments, cool. which is great. And then really quick there, well, two things really quick. One, I really believe that the sales process is different on B2C than B2B. You really need to make friends and network. And number two, there's this really, really awesome Chrome extension called Crystal that I use before I go and meet with somebody. You get 10 profile deep dives for free, and then you can pay for it. When you sign up, it asks you a bunch of questions about yourself. Then you go into LinkedIn when you're going to meet with somebody and you look them up and it'll pop up on the side and you say yes. And then it will tell you all about the person based on their posting style, their person, everything they find about them online. And then you can say like, um, I need to have a phone call. I need to pitch a product. And it tells you how to relate to that person so that when you go in there, you're talking to them the way they want to be talked to. And it pushes you way down that sales funnel. And it's a much quicker conversion. Chris, hey, I've never heard hey, of that. Rachel, would you repeat that? It's the Chrome extension, what, Crystal? I can put it in the chat, but it's a yeah, Chrome please, extension please. called Crystal with a C. Um, and like I said, you get to try 10, I can spell, um, you're going to try 10 for free. It's going to ask you a lot of questions on the front side because that's how it learns people's behaviors. But I actually had a meeting with a pretty big international company and I went on there and I, and I did a couple dives with the person that I was meeting with. Cause I got to know ahead of time. And I'm telling you, it was like oh. shoot fish in a barrel. If I Thank could tell a story, our daughter. Yeah went to college and uh, when she was on the sorority recruitment track, they did this. They studied their candidate and they assigned, oh, she plays volleyball. Sally, the volleyball player, you're the one talking to her. But AI is taking over where our little bit of research went. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's really super accurate because I've looked myself up on it the other day when I was showing so many examples, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so me. <laughs> I'm going to have to check myself to see how people need to talk to me. So. Right? But so Blaine, I've got a question for you. I, you, oh, oh, um, Wendy, I can come back to mine. Wendy, what were you about no, to say? Well, I was just going to, going to ask you. So, you know, a lot of us are probably within the same generation. I want to know your experience with the next generations that are coming up from us because I find like especially with I have a 28 year old a 26 year old and a 17 year old and they are so different 
the two 26, 28, you know, my millennials, and then I have my Gen Zer. And he is very, very different. And the way that they think and the way that they process is very different. It's almost like there's no, there's not that same hesitation that there was with the previous um, generations when it comes to selling. They are, they're kind of out there and they don't have that same hesitation. At least that's what I'm experiencing. How, how are you experiencing the differences in the di generations? Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to promote my next book, which will be out hopefully in just a couple of weeks, The Individual Team, How Fairness Wrecked the Workplace. But in here, um, I go really deep into some of the different generations. And uh, by the way, I'm a millennial. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what, what one of the things that I tell, everyone is trying to pigeonhole Generation Z right now, as they're being called. And I like to remind everybody, you know, the trailing end of Generation Z is in sixth grade. We don't know what the work habits are going to be. And so there's two things I am, well, three things I'm kind of predicting will affect the generation. Number one, they're not going to be called Generation Z. They'll, like the millennials who were originally called Generation Y, they'll come up with their own name. Two, they're going to be affected by COVID. That, that year and a half, two years of isolation is really going to affect them. My hope is that they will learn the, the importance of interacting with people uh, individually. And uh, the, the second thing is that also uh, politics is going to affect them greatly. And I say that because we've had, the pendulum has swung wider than it ever has before. So I don't know if they're going to be more progressive or nationalist or what, but, but um, Trump, who did expose a lot about the swamp, he did expose the secrets of DC. And Joe Biden, um, two polar opposites, and the pendulum has swung wider than it ever has before. So I'm thinking they're going to probably take a more active role in, in, in politics. And I don't mean Antifa, because <laughs> that's, largely, that's largely millennials. But yeah, that, that's what we know about uh, Gen Z. Um, I think they're going to come to a thing to where like, okay, yeah, the communication, the digital age, techno, I got it. Okay, I'm good with that. Let's put this down and, and move forward with with other more meaningful things. I um the, the we'll funny thing out. Is, I um I work with car dealerships and I never planned on this to happening uh, happen, but I end up training at car dealerships and most of my most of my students are are 23 year old guys. They're, they're they're all young. They're all male, and and it is it, it has been an extreme eye opener for me. I I do happen to be a baby boomer. I'm the last living baby boomer. I I just I just made it in under under the wire uh, by uh, by 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 a couple of couple of months to be exact. But I am a baby boomer, so I'm I, I'm in there. I'm, I'm trying to coach a lot of these 23 year old guys. And uh, sometimes I have a hard time connecting one because they are they are they are dialed in on their phone constantly doing all kinds of things. Um, but they, uh, the the biggest thing, and this may just be a, a factor of the car business, but the, the this younger generation, especially one, they want it all right now. And and I know when I was twenty three year old, twenty three yeah. years old, I definitely knew everything. But these guys definitely know everything. They know everything, and and they don't got no time for bullshit either. They don't got no time for the bullshit from their boss. They don't got no time for bullshit from the employees. They uh, the the uh, the uh, the attention span and the um and the willingness to tolerate something they don't want to tolerate is, 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 is pretty low. So they, they, they don't want to do the stuff they don't want to do. And they, and, and they haven't had to, uh, and especially in the car business the last couple of years, you know, you know, money's just been falling out of the sky in the car business for a couple of years. So they just sit there and collect the money. And then when you go in and tell them, Oh, you actually have to do the work and connect with the customers and build these long-term relationships. They just leave and go find a new job uh, because it is, it is, it is, they, they, uh, their their ability to uh, to to trifle with things that are are outside of their comfort zone is 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 a lot worse than I think yeah. I've seen it in any in any generation heretofore because things move a lot faster now and they are willing to move just as fast. You know, 
I don't have to work here. I can go drive B and B. Uh, go 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 drive DoorDash and rent out an Airbnb. And and they'll they'll be onto a new thing quicker than you can say Jack Spratt. So yeah, yeah. and that's, that's happening in real estate many, as well. How many yeah. of you have children who are in that group? Which group? The the yeah. millennials. The you know I I have a couple and it sometimes I have learned. I have control over me and how I respond to them. And I can't expect them to respond to me how I respond to people. You know, is that six or nine? Is it a six or is it a nine? It depends on where you look. So you have to, we are, we who are a little more mature can adjust our way of thinking and how we, and our expectations, you know, Blaine talk about expectations. I've learned that I expect a phone call. I want to hear my kids' voices. They don't care about that. A text will work. So what do I do? I text. I text because that's at least it's better than nothing. And, and that's taking control over your own behavior and your own expectations. So now your disappointment is not as great as it could be. I looked up, I think it's brackets. And so the millennials are 81 to 96 and Gen Z is 97 to 2012. And I have some in, in both. And I will say one, one thing about the calling um, is my Gen Z kids will video chat over a regular phone call. I can talk to them if I video chat with them. My daughter will be video chatting with me and I'm driving down the road. My phone is just like in the cup holder. She doesn't care if she can see me. It just has to be a video. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been interesting to see on, you know, with my with my children, because, you know, all three, uh, two in the one and two, one in the other, very different. Grew mm -hmm. up same household, very different, though, in the, the perspectives and the way that they engage and inter interact. So it's really interesting to to watch them in these different generations. Well, that was one of my questions that Brian Tracy and, and Blaine was saying all about the dress for success, the wear the suit and the tie and, and, and you know, the 1980s, the collared shirt, the, 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 the white collared shirts. So we, we all had to have one of those. But um, I'm not sure the same applies for for uh, for the younger generations. A lot of times if I'm wearing a suit and tie and I'm trying to talk to uh, to these 23 year old salespeople, they they, they they don't want to hear from me. Uh, yeah. they, 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 I'm not dressed like them. So I'm not one of them. I'm one of the other guys. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, I, uh, does anyone else have any opinions on the dress for success? Have, have those rules here's changed? A, here's a good tip that I use whenever I have to go in person. I always ask, what's the dress code for this meeting? Hmm. What's the dress code for this meeting? Because you want to fit in. You don't want to, like you said, Terry, you you want to fit in, you want to blend in with them. You don't want to look so different. Yeah, I'm already looking different. I'm all gray. I got a yeah. beard. I'm dark skin. <laughs> you know, so I got that going for me. But I always ask, what's the dress code? Because I don't want to be overdressed, no underdressed. Right. Yeah. John, you the whole rule there? still applies, though, is that. Um, encountering try to dress just maybe one step up over well yeah, yeah you're right if i'm talking to a, a millennial i'm probably not going to be in a coat and tie but i think wherever you are that rule still kind of applies dress to suit i mean if you're going to talk to a bank a group of bankers coat and tie yeah yeah um i like if it's a repeat most i i get lucky they, they might give me a shirt for their company and it's got their brand name. So if I'm going back, I will wear that shirt. <laughs> Even if I'm on a Zoom call with them and they tend to like that. John, you have something to bring in? On me, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah I, I just I just I just wanted to mention that uh what what reinforced what Blaine said about uh or I'm sorry it wasn't Blaine it was uh, someone else but about FaceTime versus uh, making a phone call. Uh, that's a, that's a situation that I find uh, with many uh, many newbie podcasters uh, with a 
their their understanding of an MP4 and an MP3 file uh, is is blurred. <laughs> and uh, I, I I have many many people who come to me and start a podcast, and first thing first thing I find out is they're not podcasting at all; they're making a video. And I'm here to tell you, fans, uh, videos may be very 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 compelling, but they're very unforgiving and they're very hard to edit unless you happen to have Logic Tech Pro. And I have not bought that yet. It's yeah. just too expensive. Yeah, it's hard to edit the ums out of a video when you because your mouth just pauses. Um, that, 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 um. That's right. I mean, I, I, I have I have produced videos in iMovie, and and what I've found works the best is for me to lay down the audio track first because the video track is just too hard to edit. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Tracy Davison is here with us. Tracy, you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself. We got a couple of minutes if you'd like to give us a uh, quick version of who you are, what you do, and uh, who we can introduce you to. Okay, sure thing. Yeah, I apologize for coming in late. I was on another uh, social media marketing webinar, and um, so thanks for letting me join here today. I, am, um, I own a franchise in Nashville called Network in Action. It is, uh, think think of a, a business mastermind for business owners. So I look for the best of the best in various industries to um, join the group. We meet monthly and um, have two groups that are being, that are built out and looking at a third, possibly in Florida. So having a great time with that. Um, I also work with micro emerging franchisors. That would mean franchises that are new to the market and they do not yet have 10 locations. So helping them find their first 10 um, franchisees is, is something that, that we're building out. Great. Hey, drop, drop your, your contact information in the, in the chat bar over there. And speaking of networking, Blaine, uh, net, net week, next week in Murfreesboro, the NASP, uh, the real meeting, uh, you, or, do you have, is that set up? Do you have a speaker for that? <laughs> I need I help Jim with uh some of our present presenters coming in and so I will I will nail that down today if any of you are interested in coming to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, before a live uh audience I guess of you it's usually about 10 or 12 uh let me know let me know. That's at the uh, that's 11 o'clock next Monday at the burger bar in Murfreesboro on old Fort Parkway. Uh, if you haven't dropped your contact information in the chat bar over there, please do so we, we can stay in touch and help each other out through the week. Uh, any uh, any last words of wisdom, comments, uh, criticisms, questions, or, uh, or or jokes? I'm I'm open to any and all of the above. Lincoln, you got a joke for me, Lincoln? No, but I have a last word. I'm looking at all of you. Look at me. John? John? Look at me, you are the star in the movie of your life. Make every day an Oscar winning performance. Thank you. Thanks Lincoln, you're a rock star. Anyone else? Just want to say thank you for having this and letting us in when we can be here. All right, thanks everyone. Have a fantastic week and uh, it's gonna be sunny right up until the tornado hits. So everybody be well. <laughs>